senior staff writer with The Frontier. And for the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to dive into the impact the COVID-19 pandemic has had on Oklahoma students and teachers, but also look ahead at what state education officials have planned for helping schools not only hopefully return to a sense of normalcy soon, but also address the number of lasting challenges the pandemic created. Um, if at any point you have a question for Superintendent Hoffmeister, feel free to leave it in the Facebook post comments. I'll try to hit a few throughout this session. Um, Superintendent Hoffmeister is in her sixth year as state superintendent, I think that's right, halfway through her, her second and final four year term. And Superintendent, it's definitely been an interesting past six years in Oklahoma education, um, but I'm sure this past year has been unlike anything you expected. Absolutely, um, I don't think anyone could have anticipated what would um, be in store for all of Oklahoma uh, during 2020. And um, I think that we even thought 2021 was gonna be a little uh, better. And uh, it certainly feels it's getting there, but not yet. Yeah, I, it was almost a year ago, obviously, when the pandemic first you know, kind of arrived and started to sweep across the country. Um, and almost a year ago, when you and the, the State Board of Education made the decision to close down school buildings, um, you know, I remember at that time doing some initial reporting off of that meeting, and I talked to a couple of uh, state education officials, and maybe even yourself as well, who, when asked, you know, hey, is, what are the odds that we don't go back to school in person, you know, at any time this year? And I had some say, I don't know what the odds are that we go back in August. And that was, and I remember that seeming so hard to comprehend at the time. Um, what were your thoughts if you just, you know, just to revisit real quick, at, you know, last March, did you see this as being something that would, you know, plague schools for this long? You know, I don't think we really did. Um, definitely Oklahoma was one of the final states to announce a closure of schools. Um, and really it was, it was for a period of weeks, you know, initially. Um, and what we knew is that in a crisis, people need specificity. They need to know what's gonna happen and how to plan for it. And we were at the end of, you know, a very few um, month and a half or so yet left in school that uh, we were then one of the very early states to make the announcement we are not going back um, through the rest of the spring semester. Um, once we gave everybody um, um, basically two weeks, part of it was spring break, um, to gear up for a virtual remote learning um, and had meals, uh, you know, Im implemented outside the building, which hadn't really been something anyone was set up to do. Um, and we were pulling down waivers from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And actually, we learned lessons through the teacher walkout that we um, were able to quickly pull those plans back out and use going forward when it came to uh, child nutrition. So it seemed to me the best, the best step forward was let's provide continuity, let's close and stay closed until we could actually um, finish this year and then move right on into summer and, um, and what we thought would be summer graduation and summer school. Uh, and it did feel like the summer felt kind of like, almost like, wow, we, we dodged a bullet. We were all expecting it to be so much worse in the spring and, and it didn't happen. And it directly correlated with it didn't happen because we weren't all together. Uh, and everyone was, you know, at home. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to insinuate that obviously the pandemic is over. That's, that's not the case. I mean, it does yeah. seem like we maybe have turned a corner, but we're, we're still in a very serious situation. But, um, you know, I do want to revisit a little bit. Um, you know, there's so much that we didn't know about COVID obviously a year ago. And I know in the early months, there was a lot of guesswork. Um, I'm not sure if you've had the, uh, the chance to kind of reflect on how the State Department of Education responded, and I'm sure there'll be a lot more reflection, you know, oh, yeah. uh, when we officially get passed. But um, how do you how do you think schools in general responded? How do you think the Department of Ed responded? And is there anything that you would do in hindsight differently or would have wanted to be done differently, you know, knowing what we know now at this at this point? Yeah, so to answer your first part of that question, uh, how do how did everyone respond and and kind of a reflection on that? I mean, people just 
kicked it into high gear and they really haven't let off the gas since then. I mean, there were, there were really just a, an incredible um, Herculean effort to redo every way of delivering education to um, have to pivot through a lot of decision-making. I mean, we were on um, these large Zoom calls with district leaders in March and April, um, some of them three times a week. And with the U.S. Department of Education and CDC, it was every other day. And it, it was all the nation and, and you know, my counterpart in each state um, all learning from one another. And, you know, there were certain things that we almost couldn't wait for the federal waiver to get there uh, when it came to feeding kids. It was like, do what's right. We will figure out um, what we need to on the back end uh, while we kept uh, pressure, pressure. I mean, I remember a weekend call, I think on a Saturday night um, between 1030 and 11 p.m. our time with uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture saying, come on, we got to have the waivers to be able to deliver food to kids. And um, so, you know, everyone was trying to problem solve, work within the framework um, that was set in place. And uh, when it came time for waivers, even the U.S. Department of Education, I mean, they turned things around within hours, things that would have normally taken weeks and months to do. So we kind of saw that all over the place. When you reflect, though, about um, you know, just the real time learning about how the virus was transmitted, um, the effect, the efficacy of mask wearing, um, the shortage of masks, um, how all of those pieces fit together to create um, some questions in people's minds on um, should we have masks? Should we not? It became politicized. Remember, we were in the middle of a presidential election, you know, state elections. I mean, it just was a perfect storm for uh, a lot of different voices and um, a lot of people needing certainty, specificity. And I, I do think that um, the partnership between school districts uh, and the State Department of Education became stronger than I've ever seen. And uh, we have continued with weekly calls um, on a Zoom meeting uh, where it's almost like we're tethered together once a week um, to just check in, answer questions, learn from the questions that are asked, go get information and, and push out guidance. Um, but um, you know, families have become a stronger and stronger voice as the um, progression of weeks marched on. Uh, with the opening of school. And, you know, I hope that engagement um, with families and schools continues to stay um, loud and strong. Yeah. And I just want to make a reminder for those who are watching, uh, feel free to leave a question in the, in the, in the Facebook feed comments. I'll, I'll try to hit a few if we see any. Um, you know, you, you talk about, uh, you know, responding in those initial months. You know, one of the things was this pivot to virtual learning. Um, you know, a lot of schools adopted, uh, you know, new technology and new systems. I know at my own son's school, they had planned to, you know, do the one-to-one -one where every student got a laptop a couple years down the road, but they accelerated that timeline, obviously, to, to, make, to, to make virtual learning work this year. You know, we heard a lot of talk about the lack of, um, you know, high-speed internet infrastructure, especially in our rural communities, the lack of access to technology. It, it, that's always been an issue. That's been an issue for, for a while now. And it seemed like everyone was kind of beginning to really understand it. Do you feel like we've, are, is that still a priority? I know it is for you guys, but is, do you think that's still a priority for our state right now? Or are we actually going to come out of this kind of better understanding the, the, the digital divide that exists? And are we gonna be able to, to respond uh, and maybe in some ways that we haven't yet? Oh, I, that's a great question. And yeah, you're right. Um, education and those who are involved in this, whether they're in the department at a state level or in a district level or a family at home, uh, they understand this has been a lingering problem from o for Oklahoma, whether that be rural because there isn't um, the actual physical fiber connectivity or um, an economic barrier in some of our metro areas. Uh, regardless the reason for the barrier, that has to become something that is just as uh, important and seen as a priority as basic utilities. 
the internet connectivity is what will close the homework gap, the ability for um, families to um, retool and become retrained or receive new credentials in a time of an economic downturn where they need to um, uh, have uh, new training for new positions. Um, all of that is going to remain front and center in my mind um, in education. But as far as where is it across the state, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think that it has to be a top priority if we want to um, attract business uh, into the state. But um, more importantly to me, if we're gonna take care of families and make sure that we have strengthened families, um, strengthened engagement um, and strengthened opportunities, we've gotta address the digital divide. It's, it's still here. Yeah. Yeah, I want to talk about this idea of learning loss. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the, in some ways the teacher walkout kind of prepared us a little bit for this. And I remember back then, a couple of years ago, a lot of concern that educators have. I think even you expressed that even students being out of school for two weeks, what that was going to do. So I can't imagine, you know, being in the situation that we're in now. But learning loss has been a big theme this year with educators worried that students are, are falling behind. But, you know, I, I've actually seen a lot of discussion lately among teachers who have kind of challenged that notion of believing learning loss is getting too much of a focus. Um, you know, they say putting it in this term kind of negates the work students have done this year and, and will make the return to school next year kind of too focused on assessments. And I'm, I'm curious, uh, I'm sure you've heard those conversations too and seen those, but you know, what, what do you think the impact of learning loss has been? And what does the state need to do you know, next year and the years moving forward uh, to make sure that we, um, that we respond to this challenge? Well, I think that this question is the most important question we can ask because um, arguably we are facing in um, education the greatest challenge in modern history uh, at the state level and as a nation. Uh, this is because of the disrupted learning, whether that disruption comes because of digital disruption with not having those opportunities. But I think that even for Oklahoma schools that have been in person, um, we have seen uh, disruption due to the elements that we can't get beyond um, in uh, quarantining, for example. So um, one of the things that is important is that we do know where our kids are in a large view, snapshot view of the of uh, across the state. Um, but local districts do have information. They do um, have those assessments that they give in their own district to measure where were students when they started, midway, and at the end. And they are telling us that there has been a benefit to the hybrid AB schedule with smaller class sizes. Um, and that that has actually proven to be a real um, benefit that we, we've long forgotten because it hasn't been around um, in very many schools. Uh, long after House Bill 1017 mandated that. Um, so we know that that is a key piece. Um, but there's other elements and variables that have contributed to this as well. More family engagement. Um, we also have a, a, a greater focus on um, uh, really those important reading skills and then you know math, science, and all the rest that makes for a well-rounded education. So we're, I think we're going to see real gaps is in social emotional learning. Um, the, so just for example, you know, kindergartners start, and remember the book, everything you know, that was important to learn in life, we learned in kindergarten. Well, that group dynamic, the uh, time of learning to wait your turn, to listen, to not speak when others are talking, um, the keep, keep your hands to yourself, all those, all those life skills that are about respect for others, and also developing your, your own self-regulation, et cetera. Those are the elements that I think we will see mo more larger gaps than expected. And so our teachers are actually anticipating that. At the department, we are anticipating that. And we've begun um, professional development that helps our teachers get ready for when we have this new group all back together again. Um, how do we take opportunities to have smaller groups with our kids and focus on those individual needs while also addressing the needs of the whole as we come back together. Uh, but I do think we'll be surprised with some uh, 
even some gains in in some mm -hmm. some places. Do you do you think some of the things that we've had to ad adopt, um, you know, have become assets? You know. I do. I mean, obviously, I, I wouldn't want to repeat what we have gone through. Yeah. Um, it, it's not not to that level. But there are elements of this that I think we've learned from that um, remind us what works. Yeah. Well, you talk about some of the challenges being maybe in the, in the social emotional learning space. And, and I think that segues to also, you know, student mental health. Um, yeah. which has been a, a major focus for, for you. I know as superintendent, um, you know, we've seen an increasing attention on adverse childhood effects or ACEs, um, the need for more school counselors and more training for educators in the area of mental health. Um, how do you think COVID has impacted that effort and what needs to be done moving forward to respond to any new mental health challenges, you know, along with ensuring that the gains that have been made in recent years aren't lost in that area? Well, it is really important that we also put this in the backdrop of um, the fact that uh, our state has a high level of um, moderate to severe depression among those in sixth through 12th grade. That's where the um, Oklahoma um, needs assessment or what we call the OPNR is measuring um, the self-reported um, mental health of our students. And um, we, we know that that number was coming down in the percentage from 81% all the way down into um, the low um, 70s and, and, and early or, or high 60%. But it is likely to swing back up because of something else we know that DHS told us that in April, a year before the pandemic, um, there were a reporting of teachers to DHS of physical abuse or sus suspicion of um, some kind of child maltreatment um, in the hundreds, like 700 some um, in the month of April, 2019. Then during the pandemic, it had windle, whittled down to only about 50, 60 reports. And that means we aren't able in the remote learning to be able to really see where we need to have um, support services, uh, embracing kids that need that safety net as uh, our teachers had been uh, one of those early identifiers of, of um, physical harm uh, to students. Now, I hate to talk about that because it only represents a smaller portion of our overall students, but there is a component that carries with children um, year after year when they are experiencing a lot of stress at home. And um, with that comes then those needs that can impede learning. So our approach is going to be to focus on the whole child, to think about not expecting those high academic gains without also addressing the physical needs of students, hunger, and for example, homelessness, those, those are areas. And then also the social emotional aspect. So we're thinking more of a holistic framework of support um, and doing that for all students. And then there is a higher tier that we can give within our schools and then there is that upper level of support that is needed outside, um, outside our schools. So providing all of the access to that is going to be important for us to heal um, and shore up a foundation, not just academically, but also in these other areas. Yeah, you know, those kind of support services, I mean, obviously, they, they take money, they take funding. Um, and they're often the, the areas that kind of have traditionally been cut earliest. I mean, we've seen, you know, a, a shrinking of the number of counselors, and some of these other, you know, support services. Um, you know, I think the, the, you know, the budget situation here in Oklahoma uh, turned out to be better than a lot of people expected. Um, and I think schools were obviously definitely helped uh, by the federal relief funds, but schools have had to spend a lot of money on different COVID responses. Um, so I guess my question is, how confident are you in, in the funding situation moving forward to be able to, to fund a lot of those support services? Are, do you think there will be any kind of investments in this year's budget to be able to, to do some of the things that you're talking about? 
Well, I am advocating for the uh, $110 million that was cut last year from the funding formula to be restored. Um, if we can do that, we will be closer then to the hitting a threshold so that the class size limits go back into effect for our kindergartners and first graders first, first and foremost. Um, and I know that that has been um, a hope of many legislators. I know that they still have a lot of um, needs in the state and they're looking at this holistically. My role is not to look at it holistically, but at what children need, what um, our, um, our professionals that support them need to be able to provide and plan uh, for those needs. So we, we are asking for that. And, um, and let's see if, if they can provide uh, that restoration this year. But in addition to that, we have federal relief funds and those federal relief funds have a time limit on them. And I am really hopeful that our schools will use those funds because they are one-time money uh, to invest in the support kids need to give that boost and lift out of where we are and propel our kids forward. Uh, we are developing a, a framework, um, a plan to move forward that will help Oklahoma families uh, Oklahoma schools also see uh, a roadmap, if you will, to some of what best practice shows and then what the data shows our kids are going to need. And we'll be rolling that out this spring. Yeah. You know, we've seen incredible disruption this past year in terms of enrollment and student transfers. Uh, virtual charter school enrollment has exploded. And, you know, it's unknown if how many of those students who are new virtual charter stu uh, school students are going to return. Uh, next year, but you know, the legislature is advancing bills that will make transfers easier and adjusting funding based on the most recent enrollment count, rather than the highest of the past few years. But what are your expectations for for next year? Um, do you think do, will many of these schools do you think regain some of their lost students, or are we going to continue to see this kind of major shift towards virtual and transfers? And what what will that mean for schools? Well, I do think that there is a very strong place for virtual education and. Um, I had said this at the beginning, and I continue to believe that uh, I hope the pandemic provides almost a pull start for those who were really working to begin a, a virtual option. A hybrid is really ideal, uh, where students can still be a part of their community within the school, um, the sports and various extracurricular activities, all that make for that well-rounded education and sense of community in their district but that they can also take courses online or, um, or you know, be full-time uh, if they want and have the ability and flexibility to be able to go at their own pace and stay and park where they need uh, to gain greater um, you know, proficiency in a, in a particular skill. So I think there's a place for this. Um, the, the other aspect though is that we are um, likely to see an increase of students that chose not to enroll. Their parents didn't want them to enroll because they were pre-K uh, or kindergarten and they didn't want them to do that online. Um, they wanted to be in person with that, um, that more normal experience. Um, and I do think that we will see a real ballooning in the number of kindergarten for sure. And then the increase uh, that we would normally expect again for for pre-K. So where we saw a loss of students, uh, it was 75% were in the pre those early um, pre-K kindergarten years. For the others, I think that there will be many who do return. Uh, they, they were perhaps um, in a school and we have some um, early data to show that, you know, some of the parents that um, were attending a school district that was going back you know, marching right back into school from the beginning in person actually chose to leave and go to a different option because they didn't want to be back in person. So I think that side of the story is yet to be really told and understood. Yeah, you know, there are those, you talk about that data, it, does, it seems like the mm -hmm. schools, the districts that had the most uh, transfers to virtuals were those schools that were going back in person early on. Um, so that would seem to speak that parents are, you know, were wanting, their, weren't necessarily comfortable with their kids being in person yet. Um, you know, but one thing that's interesting to me is when you talk to a lot of schools, uh, school leaders, they'll say, listen, I can tell you where a lot of my school, my students are at this year, whether they've gone to a virtual or they've gone to a private or homeschool, but there's always a, a significant number 
you know, not the majority, but a significant number of students that, that school leaders have told me, I don't know where they're at. You know, they're, they're not showing up anywhere. And those are the ones that I'm really worried about. Um, I don't know if there's an easy answer to that question, but what, what can be done? What can the state be doing? Um, because that is an issue this year of, of you know, so-called law students who have kind of, you know, theoretically vanished off of the off of the system, you know, because of the economic turmoil that was caused and just the, you know, the the, the major changes uh, that we saw during the pandemic. Well, we can't um, lose one. Like every student needs to be accounted for, and we respect those families that make different choices that would move them out of school in a public school setting. Um, but we do need to know, and this is something that. Um, is tracked down and it is something that we have uh, special attention paid in certain grade levels as we move into high school and there is a dropout report that districts will work through. Um, but answering that is really important so that we make sure that everyone has that opportunity and that we have accounted for them. And I, I think that um, all states are dealing with this, of course, but it is more important this year than ever. And yet at the same time, uh, districts are, I, I just can't even overstate the way these district leaders have, and school leaders and teachers have been stretched and uh, how they are trying to connect. I have a teacher, I have a, one of my sisters is a teacher um, in one of the large uh, suburban districts where it's a title one school though. And you know, her, it, she sees parents that are working multiple jobs um, and they want to connect. They want to understand how their kids are doing. And, and they are, you know, connecting through cell phone, but it might be 930 at night. And, um, and so when you have a, a, an effort that is round the clock to try to meet people where they are, um, there is going to be a need for everyone to recharge, refuel, and reset. And then we got to go at it again. And we can't lose our, our momentum and steam uh, because our kids are counting on uh, us to deliver so much more going forward. Yeah. Um, you know, about 15 minutes left here. And, and, and thanks so much for your time today, Superintendent. Uh, you know, I, like I said earlier, we're definitely not out of the woods yet, but it does feel like we've kind of turned a corner in some ways. And the big reason for that is the vaccine. You know, many people yeah. are beginning to get the vaccine and teachers have begun to receive the vaccine. Um, what kind of response are you hearing from schools in terms of teacher participation so far and getting and receiving the vaccine? Well, so far it's going really well. And of course, these are um, all of those who were eager to get that vaccine and have been counting the days watching the news to know when it would be their turn. Um, what will come is the uh, more vaccine than takers, I'm afraid. And so we have to continue to give the message that um, people can have confidence in the vaccines, in the science, in the efficacy, uh, because it is so important that we are able to have more and more Oklahomans vaccinated. Um, there is a window of opportunity that we need to make sure slams closed. And that's where the, vi the variant um, and mutations in different strains of this virus could spread. And we know that, that they are going to be a, a, a smarter and a more potent uh, level of the vaccine with these strains, and we've got to take it seriously. So, you know, my message really does remain, even though there is COVID fatigue, even though um, you've had that vaccine, uh, others haven't, and, uh, we, and our children haven't. And we still must protect the public uh, by wearing a mask, watching our distance, um, utilizing whatever uh, safety measures have been in place, continuing to follow CDC guidelines, understanding that science is still investigating and um, the evidence is going to continue to unfold in front of us. But we cannot uh, think that we have turned the corner and we are back to normal or we will be right back where uh, we didn't expect to be as the um, November Jan and December and January months came. Yeah, you know, last year, the, the State Board of Education uh, uh, 
uh, mandated that schools close their buildings. You know, of course, you're a member of that voting body, um, but that wasn't a decision that the board made in this school year. So it was, it was up. It was left up to local school districts. Now you've spent the last several months. I don't want to say at all that you've uh, uh, encouraged schools to stay closed or not, but I think you've been very cautious in saying, you know, follow the science. You know, be very careful. You know, do what you need to do. I think you've been pretty supportive of schools that have made that decision to say we're going to, you know, you know, be cautious. Now that we're seeing more teachers vaccinated, we're seeing the numbers go down. Um, is there going to be a point where where you may be more encouraging to schools to reopen? I know we're getting kind of near the end of the year, but at some point, do you see your role to to publicly at least uh, express support for schools to? Um, you know, go to four or five days a, a week? Well, I can't do that when every school is a little different when it comes to their footprint. So we know that part of the success Oklahoma has had, and it is really a misnomer to think that schools have not been open uh, during this school year. Mm -hmm. I, I hear that sometimes um, on on the national level, and that's true. I mean, my counterparts that I talk with weekly um, in other states, they have yet to open their doors at all. Uh, and then some are taking that national message and trying to apply it here in Oklahoma and it doesn't fit. We've been open. Part of the problem is we've been open and we have lots of kids disrupted in quarantining, which is harmful for continuity and learning. So in some ways, those who took large blocks of time and said, we're gonna give certainty to families, you're remote from here to here. Then they were able to have uninterrupted learning through that period of time. So the, ju the jury is still out on which was the more effective way to go. Um, that's why it's so important that we do see large scale assessments and where our students are. It's part of a civil rights protection for our historically under um, served students that are federally protected student groups, our English learners, those with uh, poverty, um, those in special education services, et cetera. But we are absolutely committed to supporting schools who support science and, and follow CDC guidelines. Veering off path is not going to be, um, in my opinion, the right way to go because it is either going to compound spread and make it worse, or it is um, going to um, mean that, that we continue to perpetuate myths. And I want to see our schools really work hard uh, to work with their public health officials to make those decisions locally. Now, I will say this, um, I do think that local school districts needed a centralized approach. And they needed to have a state leader provide a state level response to a global pandemic. Global pandemics can't be fought one county at a time or one school district at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, everything your neighbor does impacts you. And that I think was um, a, a, a misstep. And I want to um, say, here's where we are. And um, what we're gonna do at this point is to try to provide as much advanced kind of framework and guidance as we can to help local school districts then also think about what do their students need? What is their physical capacity able to offer? What needs to be modified? provide the kinds of support they need there monetarily, as well as in um, flexibility, and then um, keep our foot on the gas. And we cannot let up, and we can't take no for an answer when it comes to education has to be, and remain, and become whatever the top priority of our state. It matters, it matters, it matters, it matters for now, but for decades from now. Yeah. I mean, schools that had their buildings closed that weren't virtual, or I mean, all schools have felt some kind of pressure on some level uh, to reopen their buildings. And um, obviously, that's not that, that looks different in different districts, like you said, not just because of what the local health situation is, but it's it's a lot easier to open up a small rural school than it is to open up Oklahoma City and Tulsa, you know, obviously. Um, 
but yeah. there is this feeling, like I've said, that we are we have turned a corner and things are getting better and the weather's warming up and people are get are have, are very fatigued. Um, do you think there's going to be increased pressure on schools um, to open their buildings more? And like, what is your role in continuing to bang the drum of, of supporting your districts that feel like, um, you know, so for example, here in Oklahoma City, and I don't know what they're going to do. I have a son in Oklahoma City schools. They're open two days a week on a, on a split schedule. But I imagine that going to four or five days a week, if you're, you're talking about, you know, how do you get more buses to keep kids spaced out? And, and how do you get more teachers? And our buildings are already, you know, full. So there's a lot of other things at play than just what the local COVID numbers are. But do you expect that schools are going to are going to face even more pressure in the next few months? And what is your role in supporting yeah, schools okay. or mess? Does so, that make sense? Yeah. So I don't like this idea of we do things in education because of pressure. So I'll stand to defend the ones that need to do the right thing, regardless of pressure. Um, we need to do things that are evidence based and the right things for students, and then. Um, block out the noise. Um, there, there are reasons that some of our school districts haven't been able to stay open full time. And it has to do with people getting sick that drive the buses, that uh, you don't have substitutes to fill the positions, whether they are in the cafeteria or in the classroom. And so the operation of schools is, is fundamental to being able to open a school. And I think that's the part that's been lost on people. I think that there is some concept out there that um, school leaders are, are out there kind of going, I wonder if we should or shouldn't. It, it's, can we? And then the, the next question that they have to answer is, should we for all in the same way? So high schoolers, uh, some high school students actually are of the age they could be vaccinated. So there may come a time where that's gonna happen when the general population has that opportunity. But we also know that high schoolers um, transmit the you know, COVID as well. And we, we also think that some of our high school students can still do virtual. They're gonna do virtual and post-secondary opportunity. So maybe the place to really start that if it hasn't already happened is in an elementary school and then middle and then high school. But the key is, the transmission between teacher to teacher, adult to adult, and with the vaccine, that is now making it far more uh, possible for us to open up and have all those positions filled and be able to fully function and operate. That's the key. And uh, yeah, I, I am optimistic that that's gonna continue to happen, uh, but I have really not, I, I've probably only met one superintendent that is just, um, that I, that, that is actually still closed um, and that is not um, willing to open. And um, that, that, that actually is um, perplexing to me. Everyone else has worked tires, tirelessly to open their doors and uh, I'm proud of them for that. Yeah, well, with uh, uh, five minutes left, I, I wanna ask you this final question, Superintendent. And, um, you know, we talked about this being your sixth year, so uh, you're kind of a, you're entering the final quarter, so to speak, of of your tenure. Um, obviously, this was not where you expected to be in terms of navigating schools through a, a global pandemic. Um, but what do you feel like? You know, what are you wanting to? Uh, what are your goals? And I'm sure you know. I, maybe you haven't had a chance to really think about this too much. But when you think about the final quarter of your tenure, you know, what do you feel like is going to be your focus? Um, you know, what do you feel like is is going to be the things that you want to achieve, um, you know, before your time as superintendent is, is, is over in two years? Well, our goals haven't changed. We still have our six goals uh, that we want to reach by 2025. So we just have to do more to be able to accomplish that. And we also have to support in a broader, deeper way, both the student and those who serve in schools. So I think about the teacher shortage. I think about the academic uh, gaps in, in learning, the opportunity gaps. And I also think about our, our main values in what we do going forward, uh, which is value people, you know, start early, um, empower student options and measure what matters. 
and then act on that evidence. And that is going to be part of a continuous improvement cycle that we continue to reflect, revisit, and revise uh, each step of the way as we go through month by month, year by year. But the goal hasn't changed, and that is we want every student ready for their next steps in learning at the end of every grade level and at the end of high school. And we want them to be well-rounded and to have a competitive education where they are ready for anything. And we can do this, but we've got to have those people that teach kids. And I am very concerned about our teacher pipeline, um, our teachers who are in um, education today, and uh, how very, very um, worn thin they feel right now. Um, I know that 10% of the workforce is able to retire. We want to keep them in place, um, but we do that with respect. We do that by showing val their value and by investing in the support students need so that one classroom teacher isn't shouldering all of that responsibility. So that is going to take uh, deliberate strategic investment and in planning. And uh, that's where we're gonna keep laser focused on kids and the people that they need to support them. Yeah, well, um, that's gonna do it for today's discussion. Uh, Superintendent Hoffmeister, thank you so much for, for taking time out of your schedule to be with us. I know you've got a busy schedule. I also wanna say thanks to the uh, Frontiers Editor-in-Chief, Dylan Goforth, who produced today's effort from Tulsa. Uh, and finally, I want to say thanks to, to those of you who are watching this live or on this recording. Um, if you are in the live feed but missed any part of today's discussion, uh, you can find the entire segment at the Frontier's Facebook page. Uh, the Frontier is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to impact journalism in Oklahoma. Uh, if you valued this discussion and the journalism of the Frontier, I'd invite you to consider leaving a donation. At the nonprofit, we rely on the support of our readers, and your support means everything to us. Uh, for the Frontier, I'm Ben Felder, Superintendent. Thank you once again, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.